Thanks, Valerie. What a day. Um, it's an incredible, beautiful day out there, and you guys are all in a windowless hotel room. So thank you, thank you for being here. Um, it's a real treat to be here. My name's Janine DeLaSalle from H.B. Leonard Golder out of Vancouver. Um, and just a, we're, we're the project consultants, as Valerie noted, working with the city and the project advisory and the community to develop the citywide food and agriculture strategy. So what I'm going to do, I have about 60 minutes, and it's just not nearly enough time, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to speak for a bit and then leave some room for questions, because I know that people are very curious. And I'm going to present some hot off the press information today um, that you'll be, I think, very interested in. And uh, so we'll, make, we'll leave a bit of time for Q&A at the end. And Edmonton does rock. I love coming here. <laughs> Okay, so the Citywide Food and Agriculture Strategy unfortunately has a bit of an awkward acronym, but really the, the purpose behind this strategy is to really dig into understanding the existing conditions and constraints and opportunities around food and agriculture. Ultimately, the plan is, or the strategy is intended to set a path towards creating resilient food and agriculture systems in Edmonton. Of course, Edmonton's not an island. It exists in a regional, provincial, national, global context. And that's part of the challenge of the strategies to really understand what can be done within uh, the borders of Edmonton with, or the town boundaries of Edmonton while understanding those other linkages and maximizing those opportunities, which is, which is not an easy thing because food is so big. Um, agriculture is so big. It's an interconnected system. And I'm going to go into a little bit of the description of the framework in a minute. but to pull out those things and really write a strategy for what the city of Edmonton can do, Edmonton can do where the partnerships lie, um, what those policy recommendations might be, that's, that's the strategy. Ultimately, the, the strategy will provide, uh, so I'm just jumping to the end. So we always try and keep the end in mind. What are we doing? What are we going towards? The strategy itself is going to provide a decision-making framework for, for staff and councils to essentially introduce a food and agriculture lens to all the decisions that are made, um, whether that be roads, housing, parks, whatever it is, that, that the city has uh, something in front of them that is a consolidation of public input, data assessment, and, uh, and other inputs that they then can have an informed piece of work and a, a plan with recommendations that helps them to uh, essentially do what the communities ask them to do. It, the strategy will set out a vision, goals, and objectives, and I'll present some of those in a minute. Um, it'll contain policy, uh, implementation, and recommendations. And it'll provide tools and things, uh, things like checklists. So if you were, say, to do edible landscaping in a park, this is sort of what that might look like, plant lists, things like that. And then, of course, any good plan is phased um, so you can see what your immediate actions are and then what your medium and long-term actions are. So that essentially, in a nutshell, is what the strategy will be at the end of the day. Um, those are sort of the mechanics of the, the parts of it. But the real art of this work is to um, bring together a huge range of information. Uh, and I, what I'm going to mo spend most of my time talking to you about today is what we're learning so far and our preliminary findings. So what's already going on in Edmonton? This is, uh, I cut and pasted from our, st our database, uh, our stakeholder slash um, people interested slash just communication database. And this is seven point font. Um, you can see it's a huge, huge list. So when we were speaking with people during some stakeholder group meetings we were holding a couple of weeks ago, um, was very interested and very encouraged, actually, to learn about the huge amount of work that's already been going on in Edmonton um, in all areas of the food system. So a lot of, a lot of what the strategy is doing is not reinventing anything. It's realizing where those leverage points might be, where those um, creative partnerships might be, uh, what the kind of direction, the future uh, of food and agriculture systems in Edmonton and painting that picture. But all of these people, and I bet there's 10 times this amount of people in Edmonton working on this. It's about how to kind of bring all of these efforts together in a way that allows us to move forward together. So really briefly, um, I just I, I want to go and just reference back to the history of this project. So this work has been going on in Edmonton uh, for three to four years. Um, it's it really started off um, and kind of crystallized with the municipal the development of the municipal development plan, the the way we grow. Had, had, who was involved with the municipal development plan? Public hearings or a steering committee? Okay, 
Okay, so I'm seeing uh, maybe about 20 hands up. So this was uh, basically the, the way we grow is the overarching plan that the city of Edmonton has um, to basically coordinate everything. It's the kind of master plan for the city. It's the big policy framework piece. Um, the MDP was uh, in public hearing for quite a, quite a while. It was in public hearing for about two years. And that's because there was some policy in there that people were really reacting to. And it was just about um, the agricultural land within the town boundaries. And so what came out of that was um, council took a step back and said, you know what, we do need to understand this more deeply. And essentially what the, the policy in the NDP said is we need to do strategy. We need to do some research and some engagement and we need to bring some consultants on board who know about this stuff and to try and put something together so we can, we can actually make informed decisions about, about, that, about that land. So, in, uh, and so that, that enabled the NDP to go forward and was adopted and that's why we're here today. That's why the city-wide food and agriculture strategy is happening. Uh, you might be here today regardless of that because this is a, a different thing but um, it's definitely part of the process. In uh, 2009, council, the council put a motion forward uh, to uh, have the strategy happen. In 2011, uh, so last year it uh, was a, in a beautiful day like this at the Strathcona Farmers Market and there was a public launch. So the mayor, Councillor Loken, and myself gave some remarks. Um, there were hay bales and music and um, you know, information from a lot of the nonprofit groups in town. And it was a really positive day and it was really exciting to see all of the interest and all of the um, passion around this issue and also just people milling about and maybe who aren't hardcore foodies that are just interested in food because they eat. Um, after, after that, the launch happened, the things got, started to get a lot more serious. Uh, there was terms of reference that were developed for the project. So it basically said, these are the things that need to happen as part of this project. So there's three main things, food policy council, food charter, and food strategy. Uh, and then basically we came on board in January and we've been going ever since. Uh, we've been working, and I'll, I'll speak more uh, to who's involved in a minute, but that's sort of the brief history of the citywide food and ag strategy and the overall food and agriculture policy project that the city of Edmonton has been undertaking for the last three to four years. So what I'd like to do right now is sort of introduce the big framework pieces. These are, uh, the framework, uh, I guess, is helping us to identify opportunities and challenges. It's helping us to organize information into different baskets that make sense from a governance perspective. The first dimension of, of the strategy is the food system. And this is a term that you've been hearing a lot about. And you may be familiar with this particular uh, diagram. I like to refer to this as the honeycomb. Um, so basically what this, what this is, is it breaks food up into, I think there's seven different pieces there and it allows us to explore each one of those separately. So this is the idea that food and agriculture isn't just about protecting land, for example. That's one potential piece of it. But the value to the community, uh, the economic potential, is actually derived from all stages of the food system. And that we want to make sure that we're capturing as much opportunity as we can. So that's why we're, we're taking this comprehensive uh, take or a view. So the first piece is land and space for agriculture. So this is basic. This could be everything from um, a patio raised bed on a kind of a, a condo unit all the way to a demonstration farm or potentially market garden or, or something bigger. Farming and food production is the idea of how to get people actually growing food. Again, whether that's for a commercial purpose or a household purpose like a backyard. Um, how do we do that? What are the skills, education, training, things that need to happen, creative lease agreements to get people on farmland? How does that, how does that work? And what are, what are the things that Edmonton can do there? Processing and distribution. So this is after the something's grown, um, where does it go to get top and tailed, rinsed, bagged, uh, value added? Uh, where do, and then where do, how does it get distributed either to markets outside Edmonton or with markets within Edmonton? Buying and selling, this again is everything from you and I going to the grocery store to pick up a few things for dinner uh, to institutional food procurement and, and creating, uh, Wayne mentioned last night, uh, Laurie Stahlbrand's work with and Local Food Plus on kind of in, uh, having stage targets for local, how to buy local food. But you can't just say buy, buy local food, you can't just put a 
local food procurement policy, you have to look at the back end of that and why there's a reason why that's not happening right now and how can we sort of deal with that. And that's the type of thing the strategy is going to be really looking into. Eating and celebration. Food is an incredible way to bring people together, to create community, to create food culture, to attract tourists, to enjoy a beer on the patio. Apparently the Marriott next door has the best patio in Edmonton I was filled in. Um, you wouldn't know it from looking at the front of the building, but I've got my eyes on that for later. Uh, and food waste and recovery. So every stage of the food system generates waste. Um, how we deal with that waste determines the levels of efficiency we have. This could be something, Edmonton's already doing an incredibly good job, an innovative job, an award-winning job of waste recovery. And I learned recently that there's a commercial um, organic waste diversion uh, program that, or part of the overall waste diversion. So Edmonton's leaps and bounds ahead of most communities in, in waste. So how can we build on some of that opportunity? And then of course, um, Irini from the steering committee, or the project advisor, always reminds me about how important education is. And education needs to come into each part of this. So this is learning some basic skills on uh, food and agriculture. Uh, you know, kids, a lot, you know, I don't know if anyone watches Jamie Oliver, but he's got this bit uh, where he goes to, it's in the US, so it's a very different context, but he's holding up vegetables and the kids, they're age five or six, they have zero idea what a potato is. Then if they don't know what a potato looks like, why are they gonna buy it and eat it and make french fries out of it? So, and then that, that translates all the way up to, you know, our, our deans of our universities and our decision makers out there and, and having kind of an overhaul of, of how we're looking at um, basically how we're making decisions in our respective spheres of influence um, in a way that kind of brings food into it. And I, I really like what Wayne said yesterday about it's not its own thing, it's about how food can actually help to achieve multiple objectives and multiple agendas. The second part of the framework is uh, kind of a spatial context piece. So this is basically um, just, an, again, another tool for sorting ideas, for understanding opportunities and constraints. What works in downtown Edmonton, what's going to be an important strategic direction, say, f uh, for creating more food culture spaces in downtown Edmonton, it's not going to really make sense in the um, outlying neighborhoods, for example. You might not put a big plaza in, um, you know, I don't know, somewhere that's not a super dense situation. So this is just an, uh, a, another access to the framework that just recognizes that place and space are, um, I guess, drivers of what those opportunities will be. Green roof, you might do a green roof downtown, but a green roof in an industrial area, does that, it might, it might make sense if you have that load bearing capacity on your industrial stock, but probably not. Um, so, you know, just being, uh, I guess, strategic in how we are looking at opportunities. So those are the two big framework pieces um, that we're, we're using to kind of start getting some shape around all of this. The project has three key phases. The first one is data collection. So this is, we kicked this off in February, and it's still ongoing. Uh, and I'll speak to the different data streams that we have um, and and how, how, what the results and findings we have from those are already. Phase two is, an, is engagement. So this is when we're really going out to speak with people. And again, I'll speak to the methods that we're using to do that. And then phase three is the strategy development. So this is planned for the summer. Um, and then the eventual uh, draft plan should, is ready for the fall. So who is involved? The key group. Um, the key kind of lead on this is the project advisory committee and in your conference programs you'll see a list of the project advisory uh, committee um, in the back and actually could everyone who's on the project advisory just raise your hand up so people can see you or even stand up if that's if I can put you on the spot up with you please great so we've that's great thanks for being here you guys so we've got about a, over half of the project advisory, and this is a group that's working really hard um, and quite long hours. So they have their own <laughs> jobs, and then they come uh, to the uh, city hall, and we, we spend about three hours together every two weeks now, um, crunching through a lot of the discussion and how things are going. And the, so the project advisory is very much um, guiding a lot of this work. Of course, the public, you, you are involved. Um, there's no, multiple ways that this is happening. Uh, one is the citizen panels that we heard from Fiona and the Center for Public Involvement yesterday. Um, there's surveys that are being rolled out in the next few weeks um, and, and a few other things. Stakeholders, we've spoken with um, in a first round of uh, kind of sit-down meetings. So these are 
we're sitting at a table and again windowless conference room and really just cr I'm trying to understand where the opportunities and constraints are we'll be meeting with uh, the, that group those groups again um, later in June uh, to kind of echo back what we've heard and kind of move the discussion forward onto prioritization of what the strategy should have in it and then of course the project team uh, who's composed of uh, City of Edmonton staff um, there's currently three to four staff who are working very hard on this file and they're standing in this room and we, we recognized them yesterday but shout out to the Edmonton staff team on this uh, the University of Alberta has a quite a large role to play um, in both developing surveys as well as through the partnership in the CPI and of course our team HB Leonard Golder who we're doing a lot of the heavy lifting facilitation content generation and then eventually drafting of a plan vetting of a plan revising of a plan presenting of a plan so right now what we we've got some vision and we've got a vision <laughs> we've got some goals and these are this is the initial direction um, that we're heading in and it's it's very high level and it's very broad but it does start giving us a sense of what this strategy is aiming to achieve so in many ways this is a desired endpoint Edmonton has a resilient food and agriculture system that contributes to the local economy and the overall cultural financial social and environmental sustainability of the city now this is a, a statement right out of the NDP that the project advisor you put forward as the vision statement for the, the strategy and then we've developed five goals to go along with this the first one is a stronger more vibrant local economy food and agriculture in Edmonton contribute more significantly to the creation of community wealth a healthier more food secure community everyone in Edmonton has access to enough nutritious safe and culturally appropriate food healthier ecosystems food and agriculture systems positively contribute to the overall health and ecosystem services that green spaces provide less energy emissions and waste the food and agriculture system are highly energy efficient and generate little waste more vibrant attractive and unique places food and agriculture create and contribute to vibrant attractive and unique places for Edmontonians and visitors so that's that's our the start of the strategy and you'll see those again you'll see those vision and goals again and we're constantly circling back to these to to check that what's coming out of the discussions and the research is validating and supporting these goals so we're using these as our guiding principles for what this plan is intended to achieve of course there's a lot more detail that we need to focus on this plan can't be everything to everybody so we need to be you know strategic in what we're what we're putting forward so that it's something that can actually um, happen but the, these are the things that we're using right now to or and that the plan will use to um, basically select some strategies so the next few slides here um, are some our preliminary findings and again this is hot off the press just it's still steaming it's it's not cooling on the windowsill yet um, so I'm very excited to be able to, to report these to you today uh, so the the data streams that we're working with right now we've got public and stakeholder engagement so what happens is we sit down and we speak with you um, we have workbooks for you we take notes we have oodles of oodles of transcript and we go through those and theme everything and provide summaries um, we have an example practice research so we've gone into looking at what other cities in North America have been doing around food and agriculture as they relate to each component of the food system uh, we've just started uh, or we've just completed an agriculture inventory and assessment um, that gives us a sense of what the agriculture values value of land is in in Edmonton and we've also started a, or drafted a local food economy assessment so this is a giving us a sense of what what role that local food and by local I mean you know Edmonton regionally or, or Alberta um, can can play and how we and how we interact with food how we buy food so the agriculture inventory and assessment uh, so this is based on 2011 um, ag census data that just came out which is fantastic we have fresh data uh, so the, the first kind of key finding here is in Edmonton the total agriculture lands declined by about 75 percent since 2006 now this is a nationwide trend as well I think nationwide uh, farms have gone down by about 10 percent in Alberta it's about 12 percent so Edmonton it has experienced a more dramatic decrease or decline but it's not um, inconsistent with national and uh, provincial trends 
uh, decrease in number of farms in Edmonton from 170 to 73, so this is a negative 43% change. Um, and the agriculture in Edmonton has a diversity of uses, mostly grains, greenhouse, livestock, and pasture. And that, that's relatively constant. Soils and climate. So when we looked at soils, our study area was limited to the urban growth areas. 72.5% uh, of all the urban growth areas, and this is the uh, southeast, southwest, and northeast, are all prime class soils. So this is class one, two, and three soils. So there's a ton of really great soils in Edmonton, but soils don't make or break uh, an egg area. That's one component to consider. Uh, the seasonal moisture deficit uh, is 200 to 224 millimeters, but the irrigation that existing can more than compensate for that. Water is not a problem in Edmonton. And growing degree days, this is a, an index for um, how long things take to come to maturity, essentially. And in the three urban growth areas, there's a little bit of a range of this. And uh, the northeast is a little, a little bit warmer. Um, so you can see the range there. So on the harvest requirements, um, unfortunately, it's really hard to find um, growing degree days for horticulture crops. So, but these are alfalfa 680, uh, canola 1041, and wheat 1200. So it just gives you a sense of those are the growing degree days that those crops take. That's just to illustrate. <coughs> so crops remain relatively constant. Um, this, okay, so this graph is showing us Sorry about that font, it's actually quite small. So it goes beets, carrots, greens, wax beans, cucumbers, sweet corn, barley, um, hay fodder crops, canola, wheat, alfalfa, and alfalfa mixes. So the blue is 2006, and you can see basically everything has gone down. So, and this is, this is for Edmonton proper. Um, but the, the amount is relatively constant. Um, I'll speak a little bit to the kind of stabilization of horticulture in a minute, but you can see it's been a, quite a dramatic decrease, um, but the mix has remained relatively constant. So in the southwest, we're seeing grains, and grass, grains, grasses, and greenhouse mostly. Southeast, livestock. Northeast, grains, grasses, and greenhouse. That's the kind of dominant um, agriculture type. Interestingly, um, when we're looking at the numbers, there's a stability with horticulture. So a lot of other um, ag, uh, commodities have gone down. Horticulture has gone down a little bit, but it has remained relatively constant. So the mix of farming activities has actually shifted towards horticulture. Um, and as I mentioned, cereals and livestock went down, and horticulture was relatively stable. This is a, a horticulture center. This is Jim Hole's place, uh, the Enjoy Center. I went out there uh, last uh, time we were at Edmonton, which was like last week, and I've, I've never seen anything like that before. It's an incredible place to go for a massage and a tomato plant <laughs> and a bottle of wine. <laughs> so, and this is you know, very much um, tapping into that, the stability in the horticulture industry and the, the holes have been um, really, uh, I think, quite strategic in how they've, they've set this uh, facility up. Uh, farm size is getting smaller. This is not a new trend. This has been going on for a while. Um, but you can see uh, 2006, 45% of farms were less than 130 acres. 2011, 76% of farms were 130 acres or less. And again, these are really small. You can't really see these, but it's, it's basically um, si sorry, size of farm in acres this way and the percent kind of decrease. Another not surprise, this isn't, we hear this every egg conference you go to, you hear farmers are getting older. This is the first time um, that, 50, or that the majority of operators 55 and older, uh, sorry, operators age 55 and older represent 48.3% of all farmers compared to 40.7 in 2006 and 32.1 in 1991. So this is the first time that farmers 55 years and older are the majority cohort it, as, as farmers. Now this is sort of an interesting, this is agricultural land value. So agricultural land value in 1983 was up at $25,000 an acre. Um, this is related to the oil boom at the time, a lot of land speculation, a lot of, a lot of annexations were, were happening. Um, the 1980s happened and that land value went way, way down. Uh, recently, you can sort of, you see the trend here, it kind of hit rock bottom, slowly starting to increase, and then we're seeing a, a sharper increase over the last three years or so. 
And this is just, this is not uh, surprising. Uh, when you have land that's in a city, it becomes more valuable because of the, all the infrastructure that's around it. Profits have gone up. Now this, is, this was a bit of a surprise actually. So when you look at uh, the stabilization of horticulture, uh, you see as one potential um, conclusion you might draw from this, profitable, profitability for farms was at about 35,000 in 2006, and that's gone up, to, it's almost doubled uh, at 62,000 in 2011. So that's potentially uh, because horticulture is a higher value um, farm model, uh, so you're, you're generating more revenue that way. Um, there may be other reasons as well, but to me that's a really interesting story to look at, especially with the kind of other trends that we had just learned about. Can you tell us what horticulture is doing? Horticulture is like growing, um, it could be food crops, it could be trees, it could be nurseries, um, basically growing uh, non-cereal crops. There's probably a more sophisticated definition of that. So yep. Yeah. So in short, horticulture is stable. Number of farms is down. Area of land is down. Farmers are getting older. Farm size is getting smaller, and profits are up. Okay. So I'm going to leave that there, and I'm, I know that you'll have questions on that. So we'll just, if you don't mind holding on to those until the end, that that would be appreciated. Um, and there'll be more information on this as it comes out, and is uh, this the egg inventory assessment will be made available to you. Uh, so the preliminary local food economy assessment, um, Paul Sabai is our uh, lead on this piece, and he's been talking to people and, and doing some research around on um, how much are people spending on local food, what is the local food multiplier for Edmonton, and what are the key strategies for strengthening local food economy in Edmonton. So interestingly, you're, you're, you're spending more on local food than you know. Um, if you look at direct sales, so this is farmers markets, um, community supported agriculture operations, or farm gate sales, that's about 6% of overall spending. So Edmontonians spend about just over $7,000 annually on food on average, um, and the direct food sales is about $300 of that per year. The local food spending in mainstream retail, so this is groceries, restaurants, regional distributors, is about 18%. Um, and take, you know, take these numbers with a grain of salt because they're, you know, they're a bit soft right now, but this is just, this is, and this is conservative. Um, but a lot of it's because the local stuff isn't really labeled. Uh, you know, when you buy beef from the store, that's most likely Alberta beef, but it doesn't say, it might not say Alberta beef on it. Uh, there's a lot of things that are in the, in the uh, grocery stores and restaurants that are local that may just not be local, but they are contributing to the local economy. So this is kind of, so that's, if you combine those two, it's, you know, t between 20 and 24 percent of household spending is going towards local food. Can you clarify local in Alberta or Yeah, Alberta. Yeah. Uh, so we worked with the uh, chief economist with the city of Edmonton to come up with a local multiplier. So the multiplier is the idea if you spend one, I think, and we spoke, spoke with this yesterday, but if you spend one dollar um, on local product, there's a spin-off benefit and there's actually a lot more wealth that's generated if, if you keep the, the dollars um, local. Uh, so the, the chief economist went through and did this very impressive analysis and just basically took a lot of the egg um, commodities that are out there from vegetables and grains to uh, different kinds of uh, meat and created a, an index of what the local multipliers are for each one of those products. So because I can't fit that all on a slide, I just took the average. Um, and Edmonton has a, a $1.67 multiplier. So that means every dollar that's spent on local food here generates $1.67 in multipliers. So that's, it's not as high as some other places. I know in Portland they, they quote a $2, over a $2 multiplier. I feel like this is quite ground truth and I feel more comfortable with a smaller number in a way just because it feels more like it's true. Uh, so this, this is a giving us a starting of a sense of how we might be able to understand the impact of local food on the local food economy. Okay, so I want to move on now to, and thank you for bearing with me, this is a lot of information, uh, the stakeholder group discussions. Uh, so we, as I mentioned, we met with um, about 60 different people as representatives of 
60 different organizations um, in Edmonton, about 60. And we, we sat for basically a week of meetings in, um, the, in, in uh, the Ramada, and we, we talked about opportunities and constraints, and we were really trying to learn where those sit with a range of stakeholder groups and, uh, to, in order to develop initial directions for the strategy. Oh, sorry, it says 50 here. Let me correct myself. Uh, so the stakeholder groups we met with, food, retail, and restaurants, farmers and producers, government, um, development community, culture, local processors and distributors, community organizations, education groups, and social welfare and health organizations. So the challenges we're, we were finding there, and the, again, the questions were to identify challenges and opportunities and then what the city can do. Uh, it's difficult to source local food. Um, there's some, uh, some challenges around understanding or appreciating how agriculture really does fit into the city uh, when you have you know, expensive urban infrastructure. Um, does it make sense to have big tracts of open land? Uh, the cost of local food is often prohibitive for everybody. Um, and that's juxtaposed with artificially low food prices. So those two perspectives came up. It's challenging to make a living in the local food industry. Edmonton has a short growing season. Uh, access to land if you wanted to farm, both for urban and peri-urban farmers. Uh, there's some bylaw and regulations that, are, that are, people are finding uh, challenging. And uh, there's a generalized understanding, this is probably one of the strongest themes, there's a lack of basic skills around food and agriculture. And this is just basic, basic. This is growing, preparing, preserving, and basically enjoying food. And there's a, a major lack of coordination and ways to share information and resources. So one of the interesting, un, un, kind of unanticipated outcomes of these meetings was that people were making connections at the meeting. And they're like, oh, I've got that, and I have that, and you, you should talk to that person. And you know, that really started to happen. And it, I was really observing that, because that doesn't always happen in those meetings, because in other communities when we, we do um, similar sit-downs, people already know each other. Um, and you see the same familiar faces meeting to meeting to meeting. That wasn't the case here. People are meeting them, each other for the first time and making really important connections. And so I think that sparked an idea, and I, I think this is an idea that's been out there for a long time, is there, there's a, a lack of kind of coordination or ability to know what's going on across Edmonton, and there is so much going on. So how, you know, the opportunity, of course, then, is how do we connect and link and leverage all of the different um, initiatives that are happening. And again, these are just themes. So these, this is being pulled out of, you know, 40 hours of conversation. So this is, you know, uh, there's a lot of detail to each one of these. The opportunities, so this is smaller font because there was, people were more excited to talk about opportunities than challenges. Uh, but again, the idea of linking um, existing resources, initiatives, people, programs, land, whatever, online, somehow. Um, establish a food hub. So this is this is something that a lot of people had mentioned. Um, it's this is a really hot trend right now across North America. Um, we've got we've got Europe beat on this, by the way. <laughs> Europe doesn't. They have old food hubs, but we're doing something really cool and new with them. Uh, so the the idea, some ideas that came out of this was to have kind of a central food hub, and a food hub is essentially a place that's all about food, um, and it, it there's a huge there's a wide range of diversity in how you can build and express and utilize a food hub. Uh, but it's a place where you might have a commercial kitchen that is a certified commercial kitchen. So if you're a small producer, you can bring your stuff down, make something value-added like salsa, um, and you can actually sell that because it's through a certified kitchen. So you yourself don't have to go and, and buy, a, set up your own certified kitchen. It might have an aggregation area where local product comes in, is aggregated, and then uh, put back out to potentially larger uh, purchasers, like chefs or procurement officers from local government, for example. Um, it could be part of expanding, or sorry, the food hubs can have education awareness as part of them. There's a big, uh, you know, potential public component of having a, per a permanent indoor market place area where there that's um, permanent local food retail or t you know uh, weekly farmers markets so on and so forth and if you are interested in food hubs and I mean I could go on for the rest of the time just on food hubs so um, corner me later if you wanted to if you have any ideas about this
the idea there would be a potentially a central site and then in neighborhoods you would have kind of mini versions that are scaled down potentially co-located with existing uh, community centers or neighborhood houses and basically providing food assets, creating more food assets for, for neighborhoods. Uh, to another opportunity, a big one, was to expand education awareness programs. So this is everything from social media to um, food in the classroom to, uh, you know, a million uh, people had a lot of ideas on, on how education could really come in as part of the strategy. Um, and, Integrating food and agriculture functions into neighborhoods. So there's already um, a, an example in Edmonton where community garden has been worked into a, a new development. How can we build on that? How can we actually include more food and agriculture components as part of a neighborhood? Uh, using marketing and branding to encourage and celebrate local food. We had that great picture of the kid biting into the green pepper, and it's their face was kind of scrunched up. I'm like, do they not like the pepper? But um, having great big posters at bus stops and uh, you know, just kind of in your face advertising local food uh, for the markets so obviously has to be well thought out. But just having it really present um, in, in communications that the city's doing and, and other partners. Uh, provide a, a variety of options for agriculture spaces and places to grow food. So again, this is everything from the pot of basil on the um, condo balcony to uh, potentially a larger uh, field-based agriculture operation to something that's incredibly innovative like these these things in Japan where you basically open up a cooler and you pull out a shelf and there's lettuce there and you cut it off and put it in your shopping cart and go and pay for it. So there's a lot of interesting agricultural innovations, um, LED lights that are full spectrum so you can use those in greenhouse as opposed to uh, more energy intensive lighting for example. There's a ton of, and this is something I'm really interested in, it's the innovative part of, of giving local food a competitive advantage is, is very uh, much part of what's happening in Edmonton and what could happen. Um, of course, uh, you know, the usual updating bylaws and regulations to better support food and agriculture. Uh, in many ways, that's what this whole strategy is intended to do. Um, encourage local procurement policies. So this is not just the city. This could be hospitals, schools, um, others who uh, have a food budget, who buy food for a cafeteria or for meal programs. And how can we work with those purchasers as well as the contractors they may have to um, introduce local food as part of the offering? Uh, offer funding and, and other resources such as space. This is directly something the city could do, meeting space or space to hold an event. Um, explore new technologies and new enterprise models. There's, uh, what we're learning in Vancouver right now is there's a, a really a lot of interest in the idea of social enterprise. So how can you have a business that also meets kind of more social objectives? Uh, there's a really excellent project called Soul Food and it's, um, it's not far from where I live. I live in Strathcona, which is technically in the downtown east side, which is sort of our rough area. And uh, there's a, a bar, used to be the punk, it, is, it used to be the big punk rock bar in, in um, Vancouver. There's a parking lot beside it. Um, the owner of the site said, okay, you know what, you guys, you guys can have this to build, do something with food on it. So this organization formed uh, called Soul Food and they built these container beds. Um, they have Michael Abelman who's sort of, he hates this term, but he's this kind of our celebrity farmer. Uh, he did a lot of work in California, is now in BC. And so he's an advisor on this project and basically how to grow a ton of food in a small amount of space and then market it. So when you go to the farmer's market, you can buy um, soul food lettuce. And I, I did, I bought some, it was delicious. And part of their mandate is to train people from the downtown east side on how to grow food. So this is engaging people who may be on the street, may be underemployed, um, may have mental health issues in, in growing food. And it's, just, it's, it's on a, like a quarter, less than a quarter acre. Um, and they've been able to spin uh, the idea off and now they've got more land and the city's really supporting them um, and they're, they're commercializing the product a little bit. Um, I think they probably have a long way to go to be revenue neutral, but they are making some interesting strides in there. So new models like that where you're blending kind of a business um, with a social mandate is, is something that is, is interesting and financial institutions are getting behind as well. And then using uh, demonstration and pilot projects to, to try new ideas. Then this is something that um, cities and other communities have done really well is to, to, to demonstrate, um, to give people an idea of, of how this could happen. 
um, what, what the opportunity is, uh, you know, demonstrating uh, local food purchasing or, you know, I was, sometimes when I'm searching for images on the web, I see the, you know, the White House with like a huge farm in front of it. Obviously it's like photoshopped in, but, you know, how can the city sort of demonstrate some of these things? So emerging ideas and directions for the strategy, and this is sort of pulling out some of the top, top highlights from all three of those kind of data sources. Local food infrastructure. So this is the idea of food hubs. This is the idea of processing and distribution that's appropriately scaled and regulated for medium to small scale producers who would likely be um, the, the cohort in Edmonton. Um, growing food in the city, again, everything from field-based crops, greenhouses, uh, to backyard gardens, bees, hens, all those kinds of things that is part of what we're exploring currently. The idea of this, I've called it an information hub. I don't know if anyone has a better term for this. I'm all ears, but that idea of an online kind of resource clearing house where if you want to you want to find a community garden plot, you can go there. If you are a farmer who wants to commercialize a product, you know what health and you have some roadmap to knowing what your health and safety uh, regs that are going to you're going to have to deal with are who your point person is to go and speak with if those just seem really confusing or publicizing events like this or um, you know the taste of Edmonton or whatever it is that is out there that's happening. Local food purchasing I've mentioned a little bit. Um, how can we what's the a realistic approach to local food purchasing and what is that again that back end that needs to happen in order for that to be possible. Education and basic food skills, neighborhood designs that include food and culture functions, and there's a lot more to come, and there's a lot more that I, I, I haven't mentioned here, but these are the kind of top ones. So next steps. Um, we're, as I mentioned, we're doing a second round of stakeholder meetings. The citizen panels and citizen panel survey is, is going on right now and will be concluded in the next few weeks. Uh, the public surveys the city of Edmonton is going to be rolling out in the, uh, in the next couple of weeks. That'll be available and that'll be on the project website. So I encourage you to, if you want to follow this project, if you're interested, go to the project website. We're keeping that active. It's being updated weekly, if not daily, with new um, information. So that is, that is your go-to um, if you want to keep yourself informed. Uh, then the development of the draft survey. So basically what we're doing is we're getting all this information, putting it in our basket, taking it um, and put, doing something with it, drafting a strategy. So the draft strategy will be, uh, will be working with the project advisory very closely on that. Uh, then the, the draft strategy will be presented uh, to you for discussion in the fall uh, of 2012. And again, yeah, visit, if you haven't gone to the website, do do go check it out. Um, there's some good information on there. There's a lot of background as well if, you're, if you really want to nerd out and get into this project. Um, yeah, so that, that's the end. Uh, thank you. And basically what I guess what I'm left with, with after all of this assessment is that there's definitely some things that we need to strategically plan, plan with and around. But overwhelmingly, what, what our sense at this point is, there's a huge amount of opportunity in Edmonton uh, to really do something creative and interesting with this strategy. And, and we're very pleased to be involved. Um, and I really look forward to the rest of the sessions in today. So thanks very much. Now, if, if anyone, uh, the, we have staff, um, Jonathan and Hani with mics. So if people want to ask a question, please throw your hand up and they'll get to you. Hi, Janine. Hi. Um, I had a question about some of the semantics of the way you've described farming in Edmonton. We're talking about the citywide food and agricultural strategy, but the terms I hear you using to describe farming in Ed Edmonton is grains, grasses, livestock, pasture. And then you do th add in later the term horticulture, which says to me, bedding plants. So I'm just wondering, when we're talking about the citywide food and agriculture strategy, why is it we're not talking about growing fruit and vegetables, which we do in the city quite well? Thanks for, thanks for the point. Language is really, really critical to all of this. The reason why we're talking about the egg products that way is because that's how the census, that's what is in the census data. So uh, there's, when you look at the comparison of pasture livestock compared to food crops, it's, the food crops are really, really quite small. 
So when we're talking about what is the most common currently, that, that is what it is the most common currently. However, that, that's not to indicate what the strategy is going to do with that data. That's simply um, the language that the federal government uses to describe agriculture. And I agree, it's, it's not um, uh, descriptive enough to cover all of the things that, all the little things that are happening uh, with the different kinds of farms in Edmonton. Uh, but unfortunately, that information, in terms of the, le that census information, it's not, it's not labeled that way, so we can't introduce new labels because then we don't have the accurate information for it. But I take your point. Um, horticulture is, uh, you know, one way of looking at it, but it is, I think the, the opportunity here is on growing food, um, and there's different ways to do that. Um, there's different things already going on, and this is field-based and non-field-based. So yes, uh, the strategy will be looking at, at food growing in the city. Um, hi, Janine. Hi. Wow. Wow, my okay. super yeah. loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your presentation. And my question is about the timeline. Um, it seems to me that just being hired on in January and starting public consultations on this conference uh, today, really, um, and then going to council with a draft. I don't know if I'm still putting it weird. Just shout it um, out. Going to council with a draft for the fall seems like a super tight timeline. So I'm concerned about that because I think, as you pointed out, there's a lot going on at Edmonton. Um, I just wondered if you could speak to perhaps other cities' policies that have, like, what their process has been and if there's been just as short of a timeline or how comfortable you are with that or... Just sure, no, I, I can that. definitely speak to that. And thanks for raising that. That, that has come up um, from others as well. Um, in terms of what other cities do, I mean, Edm what Edmonton's doing is really unique. Um, so I wouldn't compare it to other cities necessarily. Uh, on the timeline, I think how I'm looking at this is um, this, the strategy itself is very much a beginning starting point. It is in no way the end of a process. It's the opening of the door to this, this conversation and giving council something to work with um, as part of that. Uh, my sense is that I personally like the short timeline because I feel like the, the dialogue and discussion, um, especially with the more contentious issues, has already been going on for quite a few years. Um, it could go on, it could be go on and on and on and on. Uh, so I personally am in favor of a short timeline. Let's get as much done as we can in that timeline, get something really positive and, um, you know, everyone might be a little bit grumpy with what's in the final, the strategy that goes forward. Um, that's a victory, strangely. But to me, it's like, let's just rip the Band-Aid off, let's cut the mustard, let's just get in there and, and write a strategy that includes a lot of this information. And, you know, in terms of the quality of the process, I have to say that the City of Edmonton has taken this incredibly seriously. They have dedicated a lot of resources to making sure that the process has um, multiple opportunities for stakeholders and public, um, and especially the Project Advisor Committee, to engage. So with that in mind and with all of the data we're currently just collecting and that we, that we just presented, I feel very confident that the strategy will be solid in its process. It's not the end of the process. It's very much um, part of an, an ongoing dialogue and an ongoing piece of work that the city of Edmonton and the community of Edmonton will continue to work on. It, it really does provide some initial direction though. And of course, um, there, there is a, council does need something in order to evaluate area structure plans that are scheduled uh, to uh, go forward um, either later this year or I'm not sure on the timeline of those. So, so that is a very real consideration for council and they, they do need to respond to those in a timely manner because so, they, they do have a responsibility for that. So that's, par that's part of the driver, but honestly, uh, I think short process on this uh, to get this piece done is absolutely what's needed and I'm confident in the process and the, the time we do have to do the data assessment. Yeah, hi. My name is Karen Zipchin. I teach uh, in the Bachelor of Communication Studies at Grant McCune University and I'm here out of my interest to offer a course <laughs> called Food Sustainability in the Media to actually uh, generate you know, educated young people who can write about uh, these issues of food sustainability that will affect us, of course, in all cities. But if they stay here, they can contribute to all of this, these developments. So I look forward to meeting people here. 
The question that I have is uh, an area that's related to my I interest in research uh, because I have to, uh, I found my passion that I'd like to dedicate my life to, to looking at food sustainability. And I'm wondering if you guys have looked at the past. You mentioned a key word a few minutes ago, victory. There were the victory gardens during the Second World War and Canada, the United States and Britain played a great role in producing food locally. And already in my own research, I found the Peel Par um, Prairie Library has a lot of information and wonderful stories that I'm interested in researching that, that talked about you know, uh, how to garden, et cetera. There was a lot of media coverage on this. In your research, have you guys looked at are there archives here in Edmonton and what was done during the Second World War? Because we can learn a lot what was done here locally in Edmonton uh, in the past. So I'm sort of curious, have you guys looked at, do we know if we have archives, uh, you know, just to look at as a society, as a community, what in fact we did do in that period in time to raise food locally? Yeah, thanks for mentioning the history on, on growing food. Um, we've definitely, I mean, we haven't looked specifically at the Victory Gardens in Edmonton, uh, but we have looked at the history um, and basically the DNA that is in Edmonton, which is farming and in Alberta generally. So I mean, I'm sh I, I don't. I was going to ask for a show of hands, but I would I would venture that at least 90% of the people in this room are either actively farming, growing something in their backyard, have a relative who's in farming, or had um, their mom and dads or their un uncles and aunties as part of a farming community. So. That is, that is hugely important context um, for Edmonton. And uh, when we were doing the egg inventory and assessment, it was interesting because we were digging out um, annexation reports from you know, the 50s and the policies that were in there and like, the understanding of, of the role of agriculture in Edmonton at that point was, um, was, was different than it is, it is now, arguably. So there's, there's, some, there's an important history of growing food in the city, uh, that'll and that will form part of the the context, I think, for the strategy. Um, if any, I mean, if you had any particular um, resources or you know places to look for Victory Garden stuff, that'd be that'd be really interesting work to do. Thank you for your presentation. It uh, provided a lot of food for thought. Uh, in the uh, in the presentation, there wasn't a lot of uh, talk about strategy around process and it seems to me that that what's happening um, with this committee and and this work is talking about food in a generic way what you're talking about could be applied to any city just about anywhere and and what I find uh, disturbing a little bit is with a focus on uh, people uh, collaborating um, and the need to be positive, uh, there's a proposal on the table or coming this fall to pave over just about the whole of Northeast Edmonton. Um, and that would result in the loss of, of significant land. And I wonder if when you're talking about strategy, you intend to address the issue of how uh, there can be a conversation between um, the competing interests, um, because that's, that's the way our our society is set up right now where we've got a planning department that wants to pave. I mean, that's basically, that, that's their mandate, is to develop housing on low density in the suburbs. So will you be addressing the issue of how you can have a collaborative system so that information about food and agriculture will be fed in other than just sort of peripherally with uh, panels of, uh, concerned citizens out there. Sorry, just to clarify, you're, you're asking about a process? You're, you're asking about the process through which the conversation in the Northeast will move forward? Well, I'm, I'm more interested in the bigger picture as well because it's not just the Northeast. There are yeah. other areas that are, that are going to be paved over unless we intervene in the system. And so I'm wondering if based on your experience elsewhere, um, that you will be proposing um, perhaps alterations to the system in which developers develop the ASPs um, uh, and, you know, in their own best interest, um, and the city is just a bystander. The, the strategy is absolutely looking at that issue, for sure. 
Um, and we're working with, so we're looking to our project advisory for um, a lot of guidance on that. And it, you'll see in the membership there, there's uh, representatives from both sides of the fence um, on that. Uh, so I can't tell you what we're going to propose because I don't know yet. Um, that's still in progress. And as you can imagine, um, and as I'm, you probably have been part of this conversation, and a lot, I imagine a lot of people in this room have been, it's not, uh, there's no easy solution uh, for how to, how to look at land and uh, agriculture, agricultural land protection in the urban growth areas. There's no clear win there. Um, there's no easy way to do that. Um, but if this was easy, uh, it would be done already. So in, in many ways, the, the strategy is setting up um, the vision, goals, and objectives for why, we, why we, would you look at that? Why would you look at farmland in the city? Um, and when there's a potential conflict with um, other land uses, what of other, we're looking, we're doing the research right now and really trying to understand deeply on how other places have overcome that and what they've done, say to do, um, you know, um, the idea of uh, neighborhood designs that integrate food and agriculture components. So maybe part of a neighborhood design will be to have uh, a working farm as part of it and the developer invests in that and kind of provides that amenity to the community. Or is it um, a land swapping or is it, I don't know, whatever, or nothing. Um, so what we're doing right now is, is putting out some ideas and workshopping that with the, the project advisory, but rest assured that the, the citywide food and agriculture, we're, we're tasked with coming up with something. Um, this strategy has to come up with a suggestion and a recommendation to council uh, around, around how to think about land use in the urban growth areas um, regarding agriculture and, and urban development. Um, but I can't speak any further to um, what that is going to look like because we're still very much in the process of, of learning not only how we're going to make that decision, but um, in, in what ways is the, is the cost shared, um, in what ways is this going to be a pragmatic response to what's, what, what's up there or down there or wherever. So I'm sorry I can't be, I can't provide you with more a more, uh, I guess, a statement about what is going to be in the plan, but we're very much in progress with that. The, I think the point here is, though, that we're going to do that, we're going to draft it, and, and we're gonna, when you see this next, um, you'll have a chance to look at how that conversation has come together, and you'll have a chance to comment on how you feel that's been handled, and it, has there been... Um, has it been a thoughtful process? Has it had the right discussion uh, around it? Um, if you did have thoughts on this, and I'm sure you all do, um, I would encourage you to, to um, just write notes, uh, write an email to, to the project team. There's contact information on the, on the website, and they can give that to us. Um, we can just, and just have a record of, of that. But I mean, there's been so much discussion on this already in Edmonton. Um, in, in our stakeholder consul, uh, discussions, we had no, nothing really new on that, on that debate really came up. I hear your concern, and I think it's shared with a lot of people. There's the other side of that, though, um, that, is, uh, that is that that land is in, within the town boundary. I mentioned the, I, the whole idea of infrastructure, so you know, there's, there's a lot of um, investment that goes into infrastructure uh, in a city, and agriculture is a relatively... Um, kind of low intensity use. So there is a question around, in, in, you know, uh, there is a, I think a valid point around really asking ourselves, you know, where, if, if, food, or if there's going to be agriculture um, in the urban growth areas, where does it make the most sense? And to narrow the discussion as opposed to this whole, this whole thing of being about that to maybe a, a couple pieces of, of land that we might have, be able to have a more constructive discussion around. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get there and we'll be able to narrow the kind of area of, of um, uh, I guess, contentiousness around this. But I, I want to I just go back up for a second and just really talk about how land in the urban growth areas is really one part. It's a hugely important part and it needs to be, um, there needs to be some solid recommendations around that as part of the plan and that's our job to synthesize what we're hearing and to put something that passes a straight face test for as many people as possible. Um, but that there's a huge litany of opportunity out there other than that, other than ag land in the urban growth areas. And there's a lot of exciting, innovative work we can be doing um, around developing the strategy that can support agriculture 
and the urban growth areas potentially. So I want to just you know remind remind us all, and I know it's sometimes it's hard not to go to that specific issue, but that that the strategy will be comprehensive and will include a lot more than than just that conversation and those recommendations. Honey, one more question. I'm a farmer, and one of the questions that I'm getting more and more from consumers is uh, they're concerned about GMOs. And you're probably aware that in the states, there's 10 states now that are pushing to have all food labeled. Uh, it's going to be on the, on the ballot in November in California. Uh, the local food movements in these states, they're saying that if food is labeled, that would really help them. I'm just wondering, has that come into your discussion? No, it hasn't. Well, it has come up. GMOs have come up, but because labeling of genetically modified foods is mostly a federal area of jurisdiction, um, it's difficult to um, include that as part of a local strategy. Um, so it's definitely come up of, uh, in conversations with people on its top of mind. Uh, people want things labeled not only GMO, but what's local, um, you know, local sustainable food. Uh, if we knew what those products were, then we could, we were empowered as consumers, and we can make those choices. Um, and then farmers who are, you know, doing that kind of production are, uh, you know, reaping the benefits of that kind of consumer desire. So I think absolutely there's a need for it. In terms of labeling, I'm I'm a little bit unclear on how this. I think the city of Edmonton could advocate and partner with the province, potentially the federal government, in um, establishing some kind of a labeling program, or so, you know, a by Alberta or something like that. Um, that would have criteria underneath it. But in terms of GMOs, of really, um, it's a really big topic. It's it's international law. It's uh, it's difficult to keep that at the local level. Um, so I, I guess I'll I'll leave it there. But big issue, challenging to deal with that on this strategy itself. 